I somehow I ended up with the least interesting, least exciting uh, presentation of the, the afternoon, perhaps. Um, but I guess it has to be done. And um, so I'm, as Doug said, I am based in ESRC's International Development Research Team, and I lead on what in Swinton we call DCARP, but maybe here in London we call it DCARP. <laughs> um, so in the next uh, 15 minutes, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the detail of the call, the mechanics, and um, the requirements, the application process, the assessment procedures. And um, after this presentation, there will be plenty of time for, for questions and also from, from our online audience. And um, this is all going to be recorded. Um, I have uh, two of my colleagues here, Mary and uh, Rosie, and they're going to take notes of the questions. And um, we're going to publish these questions and answers online. So everyone will be able to, um, to follow um, our answers. Maybe um, to start with, uh, just a word on on the ESRC itself. So the ESRC is the Economic and Social Research Council of the UK. This is one of the seven research councils. So we're government funded, and we have an annual annual budget of around 200 million pounds. And um, we're the largest funding organization organization for research on economic and social issues. And we cover basic and also applied research across a whole range of disciplines, ranging from anthropology to economics and political science. And our portfolio of international development research has grown over the years. So we, we started um, a partnership with DFID in 2005 and um, on poverty alleviation. And this has grown and grown and grown. And we have a whole range of, uh, of different um, topic areas. And uh, so this is one of our latest additions to that portfolio. And um, Maybe I'm just going to talk about this call now. So we've heard, heard a lot about it already from, from Stephen. I'm not going to repeat every, everything about it. So I'm just going to give you a few sort of practical um, hints as to where to find the information and sort of headline figures and, and timelines and so forth. Um, so in the interest of, of your sanity and uh, of time, this is not going to be a very comprehensive step-by-step uh, -step, step guide to uh, how to apply. Um, so as I said, my, my colleagues uh, Mary and Rosie are here, and they've they've put together um, a whole set of, of documents, um, useful documents, on l and um, they can all be found on this uh, website, ESRC.ac.uk/decarp. Uh, and the the key documents in there are um, a fairly detailed specification of what we want to see under this call for specifications. We talk a lot about um, <coughs> the the sort of the scientific scope and, and who can apply. And, and then there are also very detailed um, guidance notes for applicants who don't usually um, receive funding from, from DFID and from the research councils. Um, but we want, to want this to be quite broad, not only UK focused, in terms of the, the, uh, the applicants. And um, a very important document is also um, the FAQs. And over the last two months, the, this call has been open for, for about two months now. Um, we've gathered questions from um, interested parties. We will add questions coming in today. Uh, so this is a live document, and it's worth uh, checking this out once in a while. And um, all, yeah, as I said, all these documents are, are available online. Um, just let me talk a little bit more about um, the sort of headline um, aim of, of this call. As Stephen has already said, um, it's, it kind of falls into two parts. And um, so you, your proposal could, could um, focus on identifying a, a developmental challenge in Africa and really examine possible solutions and link these to China's own economic development experience. So this is what sometimes is called the lessons, but we don't want to, to call it just lessons. Um, and we want to, to have really critical looks uh, into anything that, that can be transferable. So as Stephen said, not just inward um, viewing your research has to be applicable to, um, or has to have relevance to, to Africa. So a study just on, on China's um, experience itself would, would not do it, would have to have a link to, to Africa in some, in some sense. Um, sorry. Uh, the other one, um, the other element is um, looking at this emerging engagement between African cont countries and, and China. Um, we've talked a lot about this today. and. Um, Many research questions um, came up today and, and uh, are in a way add to what we have in this core specification document already. Um, in this, so 
when we drew up this this call, we had quite a number of, of consultation meetings and consultation documents and all that, and we, we tried to um, focus it down to, to well, a handful of, of areas that we would be particularly, p particularly interested in, in knowing more about, but um, these areas are not, um, th that really doesn't demarcate everything that could be done under this call. So uh, this just gives you a flavor of what we would like to see. And um, basically this falls into um, six areas. Um, I think Stephen um, and Dirk had mentioned these earlier. Um, and and in, these, in the online call documents, um, there are many, many pages uh, specifically on, on these um, areas of interest with illustrative uh, questions, example questions, that could be answered in um, under these um, these themes, but these are just illustrative questions. So if you have a research question that goes beyond what's in this course specification, um, please feel free to um, to send us in a proposal if you think it it fits in the the general scope of this um, this call. So it has to address these uh, two, one or both of these two areas I mentioned before. So China's engagement um, and then lessons from, from China's um, own economic development. So I'm not going to go into detail on, on uh, these six themes. Um, it's worth reading the, the core specification to, to see some of the interesting questions in there and then also maybe go back to the recordings of this session here and um, listen to what other questions were brought up. In terms of what we want to see um, in these um, applications, one thing we would really want to encourage under this call is um, applicants, be they here in the UK or elsewhere, um, forming credible partnerships with um, Chinese and also African expertise. Stephen mentioned that earlier. Um, of course, as appropriate to your research question, but this is something we really want to encourage. And um, then secondly, um, it would be great if um, experienced academics from China and from Africa came, stepped forward and um, felt confident uh, to lead on these proposals. So in no way should this be a UK-focused um, activity. We really want to um, encourage um, African and Chinese researchers to, to, to take leadership in this as well. And in terms of what we want to, to fund uh, the projects, of course, we, as a research um, uh, council, we want to see world-class scientific research. And um, as part of this call, it's on economic development. But it really has to have a high potential for impact um, on policy and practice. And this has to be relevant, uh, to some extent anyway, to low-income countries. Um, all elements Stephen mentioned earlier. Secondly, um, maybe this is now going into the, the meat of the, the proposals or the, the call for proposals. We are looking for, for projects, research projects, um, that can be up to four years. So a typical project would be somewhere between three and four years. And um, you can request between 200,000 pounds and two million pounds. And that's full economic cost. So that's everything that um, you would spend on this project. And um, so proposals that fall below or above this range will not be eligible. So be very clear about what you, what, you, um, what you request. Don't feel shy to request a lot of money. Um, it has to be appropriate for your, um, for your research question, uh, the, the amount of money you request. And in terms of what, what we then want to fund, oftentimes we give average, um, average uh, sizes of grants that sometimes can't be, um, or sometimes isn't that helpful. So we, we have about 4.3, 4.5 million pounds available. Um, and uh, just um, looking at this range of uh, 200,000 to 2 million pounds, um, we, we would want to, to end up with a portfolio of smaller projects, maybe in the region of 200 to 500,000 pounds, and also uh, large of um, 500,000 pounds and above. But um, we don't have any, any money ring-fenced for these two categories, so this is um, just an artificial boundary. But we want to see small applications, but also larger, larger applications. What we will not fund under this goal is standalone studentships. And that also relates to this uh, £200,000 uh, minimum. Um, if you want to apply for a studentship, this has to be part of a larger project or of, 
of a whole research project. It has to be linked, and uh, students need to be um, need to receive the PhD of the, their PhD from one of our 21 doctoral training centers. So it is quite limited. There's more information on on how to include studentships online. A very detailed document on that. In terms of um, what what's actually in these proposals, um, we c proposals need to be at least 50% social science. Um, we would encourage multidisciplinary um, proposals, but really 50% uh, um, is the minimum um, when it comes to to the proportion of social science in there. Um, we want to see new knowledge being generated, so we don't want a repeat or duplication of, of existing studies, and it <coughs> has to have a significant potential for, for in impact <coughs> and really uh, potential to benefit uh, the lives of the poor, in particular in low in income countries. So um, this is something that we feel very strongly about, in particular in this partnership with DFID. And um, part of that is also in please include non-academic stakeholders and involve them from the beginning on in the design of your research and then also in the conduct of your research and, and later stages of your research. And um, of course, your, your projects need to be aligned with the scope of the program, so the, the sort of overarching aims of the program, but then somehow fit into um, this the remit um, as described in this document and as we talked about today. Um, and um, your, your research <coughs> should or could ad, um, address one of the these thematic areas, one of these six areas that we've uh, talked about. But as I said, this is not um, demarcating the whole scope as such. So if you uh, can, can make a convincing case for something that's not in here um, that we, we haven't mentioned, and it is still relevant to these, the sort of economic development learning that we want to see, then please make a case for that. Um, in terms of the timelines, so this this call has been open for for about two months now, um, so since no since November, and as Stephen said earlier, it is going to close in uh, in March on the 13th of March, and this is a very hard deadline. Um, it's an online submission system. It will shut down after four o'clock, UK time. There's no there's not going to be any any possibility of uh, submi submitting late. The system will simply not allow that. And uh, then in, in June, so applications that uh, cross a certain, um, well, cross our eligibility criteria or are eligible essentially will be peer reviewed. And um, in June, applicants will be asked to respond to peer reviews. And um, then a panel um, of, of experts, academic experts, but also users of uh, potential users of the evidence will be ask to, to review um, the scores, the peer reviews, the applications, and then make funding recommendations to DFID and ESRC. And so sometime in August, um, applicants will hear um, of the outcome. And um, so basically, in the, because it's such a protracted um, uh, process, um, awards will probably start in the, in the last quarter of this year or early next year. Um, so not any time sooner. So I think in the in the core document we actually said um, the first of December, if I'm right. Is that correct? Yeah. So in terms of what our panels and our reviewers will look for in your in your uh, proposals, um, so they were going to be your proposals are going to be assessed primarily in terms of their their research quality and the the quality of the research agenda, the questions you ask how intellectually um, innovative is it, how well-focused and well-articulated is your proposal, and have you articulated the methods, the methodology you're going to use? Is it sound, is it a sound approach, is it the appropriate approach? So these are kind of the, the very, the basic, but also the primary uh, criteria. And um, then of course we, we also look at, at a range of other elements, how good is your project management? Some of these um, proposals will be rather large and require um, a lot of project management across countries, perhaps. So um, we want to see that this is managed uh, well, uh, that you have um, plans in place and the, the right people in place, or in mind at least, uh, to, to manage these projects. Um, capacity building is kind of in the fringes of this. Um, 
please refer back to the documents. We explain what we what we mean and what we can mean by capacity building as part of this research uh, call for proposals. So this is not capacity building as such, um, but uh, we of course value capacity building if it can be incorporated in a, in a project. But it's not it's not the primary aim of, of this um, this research call, and um, we want. You, we want you to um, engage with uh, various stakeholders that uh, could um, be users of your of the evidence you use and articulate what the potential impact could be. And um, as I said earlier, partnerships um, and collaborations with researchers are a vital element of, of this research call, in particular if, um, if it is with Chinese and African expertise, but then also, of course, because you're going to, to perform research perhaps in China or in, in Africa, also with local researchers. So that's very important. And value for money, last but not least. I'm not going to say much about that. In terms of eligibility, uh, for, this, for the purpose of this particular call for proposals, um, UK institutions, but also non-UK research institutions are eligible. And this includes not-for-profit organizations. However, any organization applying to this call needs to have a, as the principal applicant institution needs to have a demonstrable research capacity. And um, this is like, it's, it's really, really important that this is uh, the case. So research capacity refers to the number of researchers you have access to and so forth, but also the ability to manage a grant, the financial administration of a grant. So if you have any doubts about whether or not your institution might be eligible in terms of the research capacity, please please, please get in touch early. Um, at the bottom of the slide, there's our email address. We have a, an email in inbox specifically for this call. Um, I think it's, it's important to, so to address these um, issues earlier rather than later. And as I said, this is all an online submission system, and uh, it's quite uh, it's a complicated and not very user-friendly system. Um, do register with the system early. If, you're on, um, if your institution isn't registered already, please do so now if you're potentially interested. Anyone applying, so including your co-applicants and anyone who's named on the proposal as a researcher, as an investigator, needs to be registered. Uh, so this is also something that, um, that can be done relatively early. So just in terms of what, of what you need to um, bring together by the 13th of March is um, there's an online application form using our um, slightly rubbish online uh, application system. But, um, and, and this will also include um, a full budget. So, and this is in line with our full economic costs funding model um, here in the UK. And um, there, there's more information online about what we mean by that. So please refer to that. But we do need to see a full budget um, of what you're intending to do. And then there are a number of attachments to these online forms. and. This is actually the core of your application. In these attachments lies what is going to be scrutinized by the by the panel. And the most the, the single most important document you need to start working on is the case for support. And the case for support, the length of the case for support depends um, on the size, on the on the amount of money you're requesting. So if your proposal is under one million pounds, it's up to six pages, A4. If it's over two, uh, over one million pounds, it's up to 12 pages. So that can be quite a long piece of work. Um, but this needs to be well structured, well articulated. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in a second. And then there are a number of um, other documents that you need to attach. And again, the online documentation will tell you a lot about um, the background to these um, documents. The case for support, um, the typical things you would want to, s to see in a proposal, structured well. Make sure that you include all the detail we need to see. Make sure you have information on the methodology in there. Um, our commissioning panels tend to get really irate when it's not quite clear what methodologies are going to be used. It's very difficult to assess um, uh, or compare proposals if, if that's not well articulated, even if it comes from, from a very reputable applicant. Um, yeah, and again, so the various, um, various element of, of elements in your case for support listed here on this slide. And um, also within this case for support, talk about um, studentships if you want to include them. And there's a link um, to our explanation of what we, what can be included, how, how to include a studentship. 
And um, the second most important document in, the, in your application is the justification of resources. This is really explaining the full budget you've given in your online form. Um, and so you explain to us in, in a narrative um, why, or first of all, what resources are required to undertake the research and uh, then justify each item. Why, why are you requesting these resources and um, then uh, any costs in overseas, of overseas um, institutions need to be listed at 100% of the cost. Um, so that's also an important detail. Um, but don't underestimate underestimate the, the, the importance of this document. Again, the commissioning panel will look at this in very much detail. And finally, um, as we've said before, this is the, the submission deadline is in March, the 13th of March at 4 p.m. UK time. The system will close down after that, will not accept any more <laughs> applications. Do make sure that you have everything ready well before that time point, because for many um, UK or institutions in any case, um, you need to submit to your research office first and they then submit your application to the research council submission system and there's a lag time for uh, of between a day or two days sometimes up to a week so some institutions um, that we work with a lot sent sent out their proposals to their research offices offices a week before the, de the deadline so this is really to to um, cover for the eventuality that there there might be uh, problems, technical problems uh, with the submission process and so forth. So do take this uh, deadline very seriously. And finally, we have a lot of support available for you. Mm. So first of all, in the ESSC Secretariat, we have a number of uh, my colleagues who are available um, throughout the week um, via email or phone. Um, so this is my, my colleague Mary and uh, Rosie and a number of others. So th there will be help if you want to specifically talk about, for example, your institution's um, eligibility um, and costings and so forth. And JES, there's a JES helpline and an email address for the electronic submission system. So JES is for Joint Electronic Submission System. So please use that if you are in any doubt um, about the, the submission process itself. And this takes me to the very end. And once again, let me just thank you, Dirk, and uh, also the, the panel speakers for making so this such an interesting uh, and, and useful exercise and really setting the scene for this so nicely. Mm. Thank you. Well, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dan. Um, so uh, you've all heard uh, about the, the substance of the call um, in, a, in a number of slides, and you can download this. And you've also heard about... Uh, um, uh, about the procedures that the issues are following, and also a number of email addresses that you can uh, you, you can uh, you can email uh, for questions. And there are lots of other qu documents online, frequent uh, frequent questions you may want to ask. But th there's also an opportunity to ask uh, questions. And um, uh, I hope the organisers can also bear with me. Maybe that we run over a bit in terms of if there are uh, a number of questions, uh, uh, more than a few. <laughs> um, are there any um, any questions that you'd like to uh, to um, uh, to uh, to pose now uh, to to either Stephen or uh, or uh, or Dan? I I think you, if you can make the points very quickly uh, uh, and, and briefly, uh, and then then I ask the uh, the panelists to to respond quickly. Uh, the lady over there. Uh, 